Good morning. It is Tech Talk Today, episode 247. My name is Chris. And I'm Angela. I guess it's afternoon. It is. Because we are warm and hot in the studio today doing Tech Talk Today. That little jingle that you just heard at the beginning of the show, uh, we'll get into that, what that's all about. But we have a lot of really interesting things to cover on the Tech Talk Today program today, starting with your, a good friend of yours. So let's bring in the Mumble Room first so that way they can give us their analysis. Time appropriate greens, Mumble Room. Hey Hello, guys. Hello. It's all good to have you here, and I want to give you a hearty welcome to the internet. Uh, it's nice to have you here. So, have you heard? Let's let's open it right up. Have you heard of Mark Zuckerberg's bad news? Have you heard about this? Oh, yeah. You, oh, yeah. 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 So Mark Twitter, Zuckerberg's Twitter, everybody. yep, his Pinterest, LinkedIn's probably the password dump behind it is probably to blame. Wow. And the uh, hacking group. Does he even have a LinkedIn? <laughs> <laughs> What's he doing that for? I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think he's. I don't think he's going anywhere. I'm not going to dignify that with an answer. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I have the answer for that. So yeah, that our mind team, uh, which uh, is also claimed to have gained access to his Instagram account. Um, as well as many other people online. Armine, we were just looking them up before the show, has a bit of a reputation. And uh, they got they got him. Uh, but don't know for sure how. The LinkedIn stuff is speculation. Millions of LinkedIn user accounts details were leaked online last month. Plus, recently, there was a MySpace password dump of some old passwords. Maybe he had a MySpace account. Ah, uh, probably. That might have been it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he did. Have a and it, and I, I like that he has a Twitter account. I don't think he uses it. Uh, but in case you were wondering, good news. Zuck's Google Plus account? Untouched. Untouched. They, they didn't bother. Because who would touch it? <laughs> who would go there? Right? That's kind of great. I so the password that's, supposedly... That's the only one I use anymore. The password supposedly was da, da, da. Are right? you serious? D-A-D-A-D-A. -D -A -D -A. I, I did not read that part of the article. Are you serious? Yeah. I didn't want to go that far because I was like, I just love that. I just love the headline. Well, come on, Mark. <laughs> Are you essing me? That's what I read. I just, I, I briefly skimmed the article. But that's what, that's what, it, Yeah. There's no excuse for that. There's, you know what, I think, I, I mean, I didn't want to do it, but I think I got to give that the, I got to give that the fail horn. That's just the... OMG, OMG, OMG. Oh, that's that, no good. Oh, that's, a, that's really close to his password right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> just repeating the... Speaking yeah. of massive blunders, uh, if I say nest, do you know what I'm referring to? Um, an eagle. <laughs> No, I'm not referring to... I mean, yes, I'm always referring to an eagle all the time, but no, I'm not referring to an eagle. <laughs> I'm referring to the thermostat, the Nest thermostat. No. This is the problem. Should I? Am I supposed to? Well, kind of, because it's held up as the quintessential Internet of Things device for your home. Like, this is the smart home. It knows when you're home. It knows when you're not. It manages your temperatures for you. You oh. can remotely activate it. Well, if you were still living with me, I think I probably would know about it. <laughs> We'd no, probably been, have it. No. no, it's been around for years. It's been around. <laughs> oh, okay. This is the problem, actually. Okay. Because it's been around for years. It was created by a company called Nest. Uh, a guy left Apple, one of the original designers of the iPod, uh, Fidel, if Tony Fidel, leaves Apple, goes, creates a company called Nest, creates the Nest thermostat. Nest gets acquired by Google. Okay. Google gives Nest unlimited funds. Nest goes from about 400 employees to 1,200 employees. And still people don't know about them. <laughs> buys up Dropcam. Fails to release any products in like a three-year time period. And now, after all of that, the founder of Nest, Tony Fidel, is out over at Google, known as Alphabet. So for, he wasn't officially fired, but uh, it's kind of like one of those, well, <clears throat> everybody came to a mutual understanding that it was time for a transition. Uh, uh -huh. Nest and Alphabet announced that Fidel would be transitioning to an advisory role at Alphabet, dropping both Nest and Fidel into a sea of negative press. When Google bought Nest in January of 2014, the expectation was that it would be a big infusion of Google's resources and money, and that was going to supercharge Nest. Oh, I'm sorry. It grew from 280 employees, not 400. Wow. 280 to 1,200 employees. Uh, in their first year as a Google company, they used the resources of Googs to acquire, to acquire Dropcam for $555 million. An unknown amount to the Smart Hub company Revolve, which they've already shut down. Wow. But it was virtually an unlimited budget, according to an insider. In return for all this investment, Nest delivered very little. The Nest Learning Thermostat and Nest Project Smoke Detectors both existed before Google acquired them. Both received minor updates and upgrades under Google and, of course, Alphabet. So what are 1,200 people doing? <laughs> Not getting anything done. Jeez. Yeah, half a billion dollars in acquisitions, uh, huge expansions, still managed to get the number one name in home automation, and yet, nada. Nada. 
Mobile Room is uh, is this is this category bust or is it is Google pulling another Motorola here? What do you think it is? Is it is it a bad category or is it Google and Alphabet and Nest just not m- uh, meshing? I just don't think they mesh well. Yeah, corporate culture is you know very important for a, a successful merger, and it sounds like um, you know kind of Google's typical approach of like release early, release often, have everything in beta. Um, you know, Nest just doesn't seem to um, you know want to release a product even if it's uh, you know something they can iterate on. Yeah, they seem to be. Yeah, they, they need to iterate on this. Go ahead, WW. Yeah, they need to iterate on this. It doesn't just need to be a thermostat. They need to tell people, oh, look, we can do this for you. We can have, you know, a system that enables security for your entire house, much like what I think Amazon and other companies are trying to do with Alexa or Echoes and stuff like that. Does this cast doubt I don't think they're just going to stay on that one product. What about Google Home? Does this cast doubt on that? I don't think so, because... I think I think for Google Home, yes. If this is your part of your product lineup for Google Home, and you're not iterating on it, and you're not making a device for you know, maybe a baby webcam. That that's maybe not a big deal. But then you make a whole ecosystem around this hardware, and you say, look, we have all these features for your Google Home, for you to live your life the way you want and be connected and all this stuff. They're they're just like sitting on this and they're yeah. not doing anything interactive yeah. with it. Yeah, I think that's I think it's I think that's a very very uh correct analysis. And I also think Angela's sort of a point of well, not intentionally, but just not being aware of the brand shows that they they failed to and I wouldn't even say you're mainstream. They failed to uh to really penetrate far enough to get adoption. Mm-hmm. Um and I thought about it. I actually it's been around long enough that I actually thought about getting one for the studio here mm-hmm. when we moved in. Yeah, because I thought, you know, maybe you could learn when I come and go and stuff like that, because that's supposed to be part of its features, but never really got me. While we're talking about Google, let's talk about some good news, though. I'm I'm thinking uh, Android N is shaping up to be a really solid release. Nutcase. Uh Nutella, nougat. Probably nougat. You think? Probably nobody knows how to spell it. Nougat or uh, there's a title there, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it, so. Uh, Android N has got a couple of new security features that I think are pretty neat. Uh, I've, I've been experimenting a little bit on an old Nexus 5, but it's just not powerful enough hardware to really get a sense of it. But here's a couple of things that I think are nice improvements for Android. Number one for me, seamless updates. Mm, yep. This is a big one. Seamless updates will use two separate system partitions. One of them is the system you're running as your phone every single day. And then when it's time for an update, the other system partition gets altered and updated first. The next time you reboot, you're automatically switched over to the other partition. The next time there's an update, the other system partition gets changed and you Holy switch back. Holy crap. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It's actually kind of what Canonical does with yeah. uh, their phone. Um, and it's a great idea. This means things can be done while you're working or playing. And when it's finished, all you have to do is just reboot. Google says you'd be surprised... But a pretty large chunk of people do not update their phones because it takes a while. And so then can you manually go back to the other particip- partition if something looks or seems messed up? I don't know if there will be a user-exposed way to do it, but I bet you there's a way to figure it out. Because yeah. uh, um, you'd want to have that functionality if yeah. something goes wrong. Well, it seems like that would be the point. Like, yeah. it's a failover yeah. is what it is. Yeah. I'm, I bet it does failover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you can choose it, though. Yeah. Um, I've been just beginning to play with it. I haven't noticed that. Uh, but they have been doing pretty steady updates. Uh, so I think that's kind of cool. I don't buy that a lot of Android users aren't updating because it's slow. I bet there are some that put it off, but I think the major reason is OEMs. So tell me this. So d- are you notified that there was an update made? Or like, because I, I only so. reboot my phone when I when I notice that it's lagging or having problems. <laughs> so uh, the way it works in my experience so far is I get a download and install prompt, and then I get a, uh, okay, it's ready prompt, and then I just oh, restart. Oh, okay, just like computers. Yeah, yeah, basically. Restart an hour later. But and a little safer. You kind of know, like yeah. in your head, okay, I haven't restarted it yet, but maybe if I do, something will be faster or yeah. whatever. So uh, Stage Fright was a bug that took advantage of the Android media framework that ran as a super privileged user, and you could exploit an Android phone. Uh, by just getting somebody to play a media file via a link or a download or something like that, and it could force the phone to reboot or lose all audio. It was a pretty nasty issue. So on Android N, the media server gets a big overhaul. Google's broken up the media server into smaller components that can be updated outside of a full system update, just like they did with the WebView component. 
Uh, that's really nice because they can push out new patches via Google Play without having to wait six months for, say, a company like LG to get the patch out to you. They also changed the permission model for the media server, no longer giving it full system permissions. Running with low privileges makes it even harder for anyone to crack into the system if they don't get into the media server. And then last, but I think not least, and this I think will be a big source of performance improvements, in the past, Android used block-level encryption, where they, they encrypted the entire storage device. And in fact, it was so slow, a lot of OEMs just refused to enable it by default. <clears throat> Few phones have it turned on by default. And it was kind of a big flop. With Android N, things have been changed to file-level encryption, using a direct boot feature for two-level security. Check this out. When your Android device boots up, or you know reboots in your pocket or something, the device is encrypted and locked down, just like the iPhone is. Uh, only certain applications can run. And this is called direct boot mode. It means you can still get phone calls or have an alarm go off or even see some notifications, but you really can't do anything more than answer the phone. If you want to do anything else, you'll have to unlock the device, which will also decrypt the device. Hmm. Some other stuff going on, too, that should help lower-end devices be able to do encryption a little better. So I think N is going to be a really solid release. Anybody in the mumble room tried it yet or have thoughts on Google's direction with Android? I'd love to try it, but I'm stuck on a Samsung phone that doesn't get updates. Oh, see, that's where the seamless updates won't matter Which, to you. Um, it's actually well, but the whole thing with the improvements um, uh, for uh, lower end devices is cool because I've been recently moving towards maybe not spending seven hundred or eight hundred dollars on my phones. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been looking at things like uh, Motorola X Play um, mm-hmm, nice. or Moto G even, which if the, the Motorola devices are cool because they do get updates early on. Um, and they have a light touch of the UI to begin with. Uh, yeah. in ca- <clears throat> yes, which is another thing that's really cool about them. So now if I get uh, can get all these uh, Android improvements that will allow me to have uh, better encryption and everything, that's awesome. And on a phone that doesn't cost a pile of money. Yeah, good point. Someone in the chat room points out that that does isn't that kind of a waste of space, like two to four gigs to have that partition? And I wonder. I wonder if they only yeah. have the differences too. They could, you know, they could do it in a way where they could link all the files are well you of course you wouldn't really want to do that for i'm not sure yeah i i, I, I plan, only have like two gigs left on my phone oof. like i keep having to delete stuff my plan is when n is out to go sort of in depth with it i've been trying the beta app, but the performance is sort of hit and miss so i haven't spent a ton of time with it but it seems like a pretty big upgrade for android and just on the direction of android just really quickly there's several things that google announced uh at io and that they're doing in n that i think show them being clever about what i considered to be in the past to be limitations around android that they're making improvements on mm-hmm. um and they a lot of times there are there are problems in android that i go oh this is this is a huge problem this is architecturally a bad idea and then they come up with a really clever play store side workaround or a really clever technological solution or they pivot, like in the case of this file encryption that they're doing, going from block-level en- encryption to file-level encryption. Um, I like it, and I think it's a good improvement. I, I, have, think- I have a question about Android. So I know that the Android releases go by the way of the alphabet, and that's why we're on Android N. Um, do people have to upgrade to, to M, to Marshmallow, first before they can get to N? Or And how would anybody even know what they're running. <laughs> like I just yeah. I don't run it. That's in the about area. You know, you can go into your phone settings okay. about, but um I don't know. I've never gone from like say four to six. But yeah, you can upgrade. Uh the problem is is not that it's not a it's not about what you can do. It's what you're allowed to do. See so the mm-hmm. vendors that make so Samsung makes the phone, right? LG makes the phone and they're the ones that update it, not Google. Oh, okay. Whereas you buy a Nexus device uh-huh. Then it gets updated directly from Google. So that's why, like, when I'm doing testing on, a- on oh, Android so N, I'm, I'm doing it on a Nexus 5 because... It's already been pushed. Or a 5X, basically. in this case. Yeah. Because it's, 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 Google's, uh, it's Google's direct update path. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a weird... It's a weird... Like, if you asked... I think if you asked an average consumer Android user what version of Android they're on, they'd really have no idea. Right. Okay, right. that's what I figured. This story's going around. hasn't gotten a ton of coverage yet, but I definitely want to give you guys a heads up because it's it's basically completely a social engineering trick that yeah. you might almost fall for. It's clever as ass. Yeah, so it's a way to get around Google's two-factor authentication via text message. But and once we tell you about it, then you'll be like, oh, yeah. yeah. 
So you, it starts by you get a text message that looks super legit. Uh, it comes in Google notification and Google's TM. They've even trademarked the Google name. Which yeah, is, yeah. We've recently noticed a suspicious sign-in attempt too, and then it says your your Gmail account from the IP address, and it you know puts a, it puts some random location. If you did not sign up in this location and would like to lock your account temporarily, please reply to this alert with the six-digit verification code you'll receive momentarily. If you didn't authorize the sign-in attempt, please ignore this alert. So when they actually try to log in and Google checks with you, mm -hmm. then you get the code from Googs and then you reply back. You're not yeah. clicking on a link. You're not right. opening up a web page. You're not you're just, talking to some guy in India. You're just simply responding to Google's automated security system. Yep. Supposedly. Yeah. Uh, and that's how they're getting around Google two-factor authentication. Uh, Which is crazy. And I guess, again, they speculate because of the recent large password dumps, it's happening more and more. Yeah. And people are mostly reporting on Twitter and on forums because it's not really a flaw in Google. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. It's just somebody has finally created an actually well-worded, well-crafted yep. social engineering yep. message. And the trick is they, they've got your password because you use that same password somewhere else, right. like on LinkedIn, and you use that at your Gmail. And right. once they've got your Google account, and they can they can get your phone number from that, they can text you. Well, and they got so you. and they're texting you from one phone number, and then the code's going to come in from another, which is actually that should be a red flag for you. But because that text is telling you expect this code, and then you know they're hacking and like yes, send me the text code. Like they're they're orchestrating it. They're they're it's a puppet show, you know. Yeah, North they're setting Ranger, you up to expect it. Yeah, North Ranger exactly. North Ranger says he could see a lot of relatives falling for this. So yeah. yeah. I just got them trained not to click on or not to tap on links from text messages. Oh. You know, so how am I supposed to explain this? <laughs> oh, I didn't realize you were in the mumble room too. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think part of the issue is <laughs> I think the part of the issue here is that um, a lot of email actually most email clients uh, went that route of not showing the email address of the emails that you received. They just showed the name. Uh, and I think it would be much better if the the actual address was in big bold letters right on the top of the page. So it's something shady, or if, if somebody claims uh, that they're from I don't know Microsoft, Google, Apple, whatever, you can see immediately that it's a suspicious email address, uh, and it doesn't have to be on some blacklist or whitelist for. Um, um, you know, Google to detect it or for your email client to detect it because in, uh, all you have to do to uh, avoid getting uh, called by a blacklist is to buy a new domain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this one, because the whole system works over text messages, is, you know, it's also another, that's another vector that people Bypass. don't consider. Yep. Yeah. If it was email, they it's were a little, a little more trained. I yep. want to talk about a trend that I think is great and the industry is already mocking it. And I hope. I hope that people get over the initial shock and get behind this, because I think this could be great for podcasters. Uh, there are several companies like Zotac, HP, and MSI that are now pushing backpack PCs. Hmm. My first thought when I saw this was, why have we never done this before? Why is it 2016 <laughs> and this is the first time we're really seriously it, talking you know, about- It's because it wasn't in Back to the Future, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> or Star Trek, <laughs> yeah, or Star right, Wars, yeah, right? or 2001 the, Space Odyssey. They did the Odyssey. damn tricorder cell phone <laughs> yeah, thing. You yeah, know, that's right. what we went with. That's true. <laughs> now, they're claiming, look at that, with cushions on the back, oh, straps. Oh, come on. What is this about? Oh, anyway? are you saying this is brilliant? Why? So, um, well, it's for VR, first of all. It's so that way you don't have the cord oh, problem. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, you throw the PC on your back. But, but what, like, people do VR at their house, though. You still have the problem of, like, dragging cords across the room. Huh. So this would be like one McCord okay. for power or okay. something. Okay. But you know what I'm thinking? No. <laughs> Freaking live streams. Like this, yes. you throw Linux on this thing, yes. put OBS on this thing, put a, put it on our back, walk around wow. Linux Fest, and live stream the Is this crap. Is Kickstarter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. No, they're just, they're already making Wow, them. that seems pretty cool. Oh, and then, you, yeah, you can decorate it with our stickers. Totes, yeah. So they say, yeah. they say the VR experience is really enhanced by feeling the freedom that these backpack PCs offer with user-friendly solutions. Now, they range from all kinds of prices, like two grand. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, we, down. You should have coughed there. Two Probably, grand. <laughs> they, the vaguely Q3 for MSI. You know, we don't. We're not like getting... MSI, the one that made the MSI wind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Chris, are you really going to walk around? Want to walk around your house with a sweaty VR headset and 400 watts of PC on your back? Well, his house has AC. Yeah, <laughs> the rig does. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, yeah. 
yeah. This guy, I mean, anything for technology, really. Like the VR is so cool. But the real problem is one of the things I'm worried about is I've you know I've I've played with both extremes from Oculus to the Gear VR, and the and the Gear VR is so pathetic in terms of graphics capability. But the one thing it definitely has going for it is shareability. Because you don't have to hook somebody up with four or five wires and teach them not how to get entangled while they're walking around inside huh. a virtual world. It really is like the biggest barrier when you're having somebody else try out VR. And so, wow, no kidding. Tripping. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like a power cord, a US, two USB cords, an HDMI cord. There's like all kinds of cords. And of course, it was worse on the SDK units than it was. Uh, 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 but anyways, uh, I plus, I also think the production aspects of this could be really fun. Oh, I, yeah. I don't know. I I don't know. I mean, imagine. Imagine. You're going on a hike. You bring your computer with you instead of your hiking gear. You die, but you get the game <laughs> while you die. <laughs> I mean, all right. Now, we didn't bother putting this one as a fundraiser because uh, this is going to be a little extreme. But this is, uh, instead of going Whoa. with the whole town, how about a super yacht? It was converted from an old supply ship, and now they're selling it for $62 million. We could have a, a floating broadcast studio. What do you think, <laughs> Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Make that a make that a Patreon milestone hey, there. Hey, YOLO. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just pay that off until we die, and then let our grandkids and our great grandkids, grandkids and, and their, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody's gonna pay for this. Oh wow! It can be at sea for thirty days at a time, so we could actually go and broadcast from different locations. Well, I mean, how? Why? Room for thirty-six oh, passengers, satellite, so we satellite. could bring we could bring audience members on and make them pay. Well, <laughs> that's yeah. how we can afford it. <laughs> it's got a helicopter Post helipad. And cruise. It's got a helipad. Come on, Ange. Wow. Come on, don't we want the JB Copter? Yeah, and Tyler could dri- ride, uh, drive it. 260 feet long. He's a pilot. It's a little bit longer than Lady Jupes, so oh. <laughs> I need somebody else to drive it. Yeah, it'll move at 15.4 knots, so I think uh, we ought to get in on this. You can find out more at the $62 million super yacht that was converted from an old oil tanker. Uh, I think that's kind of amazing. Uh, they call it a luxury yacht. I don't know about that. Yeah, it looks a little bigger than just 36 people, but yeah, only 36 people. Yeah. Well, big rooms. Yeah. Big, big rooms. All right. So, okay, maybe we can't really crowdfund that, but we might be able to help the Kickstarter of the week. Kick it! Woo! All right. So, this, I think, might be perfect for you. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, and I tell you what, it's it's got some stink behind it. it ha- they were going for $160,000, and they've already raised $525,000 with 32 days left to go. Okay, let's see what so it is. So I think this thing is legitimately solving a problem. With 3,085 backers, I introduce you to Portal. Portal is turbocharged Wi-Fi. Hmm. Introducing the biggest breakthrough in Wi-Fi in 15 years. With access to triple the spectrum enabling up to 300 times faster performance than the typical consumer router. 10 state-of-the-art internal radios, active MIMO beamforming, and nine powerful antennas for amazing range and coverage, all without compromising design and style. Portal is, we believe, the fastest, strongest Wi-Fi. It's able to adapt to changing environments, able to adapt to congestion and traffic something that you've never had to manage because it was smart enough to manage itself. Wouldn't it cause get, traffic? Uh, faster <laughs> Wi-Fi, no matter what the condition is. They explain why in a sec. A much more reliable uh, connection. Imagine, if you will, a six-lane freeway. But for the last 15 years, everybody's really only driven on one lane. And I'm going to stop right here. So he's talking about the different Wi-Fi channels. And um, technically, you could really, you can put it on different channels, but... In practice, like I have this app called Wi-Fi Analyzer, and you look at people's Wi-Fi setups, and almost always, uh, everyone's on channel one. Hadia's office building, where she's at, everybody, mm-hmm. everybody in the entire building is on channel one. And I think it's just like what the ISP does, or whatever. In fact, they talk a little bit about this. So, or maybe two if you're lucky. Or channel six, you ask yeah. Yourself, why are these four lanes not being used? Two through five. Well, we solved that problem. Portal uses all of those lanes. Woo! It does it intelligently. You can change lanes predictably to avoid interference and to avoid traffic. A big part of the Wi-Fi spectrum actually is reserved for radar. Wi-Fi is allowed to share on it, but to share it, you have to make sure radar is not present. And that's a very delicate and very highly regulated environment. We've received certification for doing that. The way we achieve that is we've been working with the FCC for quite some time. All of our products uh, are now authorized to work within those radar bands. So That's big. one of the key applications we developed Portal for was gaming. What we wanted to do is create some special channels 
that offered both high bandwidth <laughs> and very low latency. And we control the access to those channels so that if we know you're gaming and we can detect that automatically, uh, we'll give you the best gaming experience possible. We're looking to build a community of people who are serious about improving Wi-Fi and want to work with us on development of the product. Our goal is to make it a platform so that as Wi-Fi grows and develops into different areas, that we're one of the first guys who can support that. But we need your help and support to do that. There's no other router in the world that can do what we do. This is the solution. Please help us fund our Kickstarter. Now, is that really true? I think we can change Wi-Fi forever. Now, I would if they said we are the first router to make this approachable to consumers, I would agree. But you know, there's other uh, there are other solutions out there right now. Um, I'm I'm thinking of uh, that use the radar. Uh, channel? Well, no. no I, I don't know about that specifically, but, but Aero, E E R O, they specifically have a different type of Wi Fi that is. <laughs> it's, oh, see, so there, here's an example. <laughs> Watching the video buffers. This is yeah. what it's like at my house. Seriously. Oh. Why? So he has to go reboot the router. This is legitimately my life right now. Counting. Is the Wi Fi out again? That's Dylan. Maybe we should try moving the router. Yep. That's me. Because I just I have a little MiFi and it's it's so weak, it can't even cover the whole RV. It's on the kitchen table now. The yard's taken a lot of work. Choosing the Wi-Fi network. Yep. I want to show you how to extend the Wi-Fi. Yep. Trying out different solutions to extend the Wi-Fi. Thousand percent. And videos buffer. Like, sometimes my internet connection is fine, but my Wi-Fi is so weak I can't stream video. Because of my Wi-Fi. He turns on a Rube Goldberg machine. Give it a sec. <laughs> <laughs> I've been contraption to reset the router. I need that. Wait, he's got a box at the door. What could this be, Ange? See how it's, it's three devices. So they sell them in sets of two or three or more. And the idea is... Is Eero. It's not a router. It's a Wi Fi system. You place Eros throughout your home to create a wireless mesh network that blankets every room in fast, reliable Wi Fi. Already in your inbox. Done. So uh, this is essentially what uh, what Noah does uh, using Ubiquity systems. Only this is a consumer version, and they they specifically like when you go to buy it. This is one that's not even a Kickstarter. This is just available right now. See, they sell it in packs. So pack of two, pack of three, or just one. And what does that price look like? So pack of three is five hundred bucks. Ah. Pack okay. of two is three fifty. Hmm. Pretty expensive stuff, though. So we couldn't even find the routers in the house. <laughs> so these guys. <laughs> These guys are claiming that you know they've they can do this extra channel hopping and uh, somehow take advantage of extra channels that don't truly exist and get better coverage. However, that said, I am so desperate for good Wi-Fi. Like I don't know if you saw Rika in the chat room. It is so freaking bad here because there's so many. Soon as it's really gotten bad since Comcast start, started turning everybody's modem yeah. into an AP because everybody here is on cable. Right. Plus, then you have the airport nearby, which seems to just blast us with signals from yeah. time to time. The airport being like literally with planes, not the Apple Airport. Right, <laughs> and so uh, it is. Uh, it is a Wi-Fi nightmare here in the studio. So I'm desperate. If something like this existed, I mean, look, their starting price, 150 bucks. And which one are we at? For I'm uh, sorry, for the original Kickstarter one. Okay. For the one that does all the fancy beam forming. Now the chat room's all asunder. Does anybody in the mumble room have thoughts about this? Uh, this fancy dancy uh, f uh, channel forming portal turbocharged Wi-Fi device. So do clients even support those bands? Like, will that actually be enabled on most wireless clients? Yeah, it's definitely going to depend on the, on the, I think anything modern, anything that has I just find this 11. gimmicky, like you're going to ha like enable the use of the spectrum if you have a client that supports it. But right. who's going to have a card that supports that today or when this thing comes I think, out? I think anything that does 5 gigahertz probably supports it just as part of that being new enough standard. Uh, I was just reading too, trying to figure it's out. It's possible. I was trying to figure out why our Wi-Fi is so bad here, and I guess uh, 
weather st- weather stations and you know the things that look monitor and report weather and and, and uh, that's going to be a problem even with this right because it's going to detect to see if there's radar in the area and right. not interfere with ah. it and so even in your case that's not going yeah, to help you exactly. if there is a radar station there nearby, is a five you gigahertz near yeah you live near an airport so there's going to be a weather radar nearby right so yeah, the I weather think radar is exactly why the FCC um, you know passed that regulation and it's causing router manufacturers to lock down their firmware now so people don't turn off the dynamic frequency selection. So what do you think about this? So, you know, every time I talk Wi-Fi with people, they say, well, there's only really three channels. There's only really three channels. And on here, 2.4. Uh, yeah, on 2.4. And here they're saying, well, we're going to use all six. We're going to use all six. What's so... Explain to me. What's the discrepancy? So the problem is they actually do tend to overlap. So when you transmit on, say, channel one, you're going to be transmitting a signal that does somewhat overlap in the frequency spectrum with, you know, two to four or something in that range mm. and quite get all the way to six. But if you use, say, four, you would actually cause interference for people on one and six because you are producing some signals with that frequency. These antennas aren't perfect. I see. They do have variances in the way they transmit signals. So you will get some things outside of the spectrum you're supposed to be transmitting on. That and that's sense. why they allow the tolerances. And that's why no one else uses the in-between ones, because one and six are far enough away that your radio isn't going to have enough variance in the output that you're going to hit six from one. There's a belly clap. Yeah, I like that. That's a good. That's a good explanation. So, huh, it seems like I'm I'm a little worried about this in the sense that maybe they use one, six, and eleven simultaneously. It seems in like which they case do. You're just gonna blast your neighbors. I think that's exactly what well, that's they what, do. Yeah, that's what I said when it said you won't you won't have the like. I think you're just gonna be causing a jam. Yeah, I wonder. I, you know, or now you're just gonna have the strong. You're gonna have so now. Everyone else has one of these, and you have one, and you're all interfering with each other. I don't know. I don't know if this really fixes anything in dense areas. Can they be And friends? it does say that performance is not great in dense areas. Like, it was only 2x or something in dense areas. Mm-hmm. A single so, portal yeah. can offer complete coverage for 2,500 square foot, and two portals can be daisy-chained using the proprieta- proprietary enterprise-grade mesh technology to extend your range 200 feet more, more than enough to cover a 500 square foot home. That's going to, in other words, that's a big range of interference. <laughs> Especially around our neck of the woods. Mm. So, are we coming to the decision not to fund? I actually thought we might fund this one. Boy, we're just a curmudgeonary group. If anything ever gets past us. The problem is you can do this with existing technology, either right, through well, ubiquity. Right. And that's what they're doing. Yeah. yeah, or when Raspberry Pi came out, didn't there was a way to mesh those together yes. to do you could You could make thing. wise Raspberry Pi's APs and do the same thing. It would take a lot more work. See, this is an off-the-shelf right. you, you know, solution. So, we're giving it a fail? No, I, I, it's a great product. I just, the I firmware looked like. Is it possible? I don't know about that. They're not. I don't, is it like a moddable thing potentially? I don't, I don't think so. I don't see. I read through their. Does. I read through their fact, and I don't see anything about that. Um, so I doubt it. I think I, it's a great product and a great possibility, but I, I think it might be too soon to fund it. The only thing I could see, and this is the thing I don't like about it, is it's a proprietary rolling code with dynamic secure guest networks. So that, oh, rolling code, they probably mean the actual code. Okay. I was thinking. Yeah, so yeah. it's probably going to be like yeah. the on hub and that it always gets updates. And yeah. It's just automatic and stuff. Yeah. All right. I, I don't know. I'm thinking it's a fail. I think it's, a, I like part of it, but we'll put a link in the show notes. Boy, when we finally approve one, it's going to be a historic moment. It's going to be, <laughs> in the meantime, Use those saved pennies to support the entire network and all of the shows we produce over at patreon.com slash today. Uh, we've been posting, with to some degree of success, the uh, live streams from time to time uh, throughout the week, and people seem to be enjoying them. There was a four-hour TechSnap live stream that got posted. Yeah, it was a double, yeah. And basically, by live stream, that's the pre, pre-show, pre the in-between segments, and yeah. the post-show, so, all in one file. Yeah, it's, a whole, it's the whole thing, everything. And the show, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and it it took a lot of work. It took us reaching a milestone of funding to be able to afford the hardware to do it. And so it seemed appropriate that you guys would get the best results from it. We're still tweaking it. We'll eventually have feeds and all that kind of stuff. But right now, it's still early days. We're working the back end stuff out. Um, so we really appreciate your support. Plus, you get access to goodies there. And you keep us on the air. There is a cord cutter level if uh, we are one of your primary sources of content and you want to kick back. There's also a swag level if you really want to go all in and help us out a whole bunch and get yourself something great from time to time. Now, I want to just do a little PSA while we're in the patron segment. This week, a little cray cray. No uh, BSD Now or TechSnap right. because they were pre recorded. So we'll still have the regular published versions, but no live. And then on uh, Tuesday. Tomorrow. Yeah. Along with Linux Unplugged, we're also doing live unfilter. 
Yep. So instead of Unfiltered being on Wednesday, it's going to be Tuesday night, and we're going to do live coverage of the uh, California primaries and all of that to see where the uh, Democratic race is going, do our live thing that we do from time to time on Unfiltered, and you guys will be welcome to hang out with us live for that. Yep, 4.30 Pacific. Go to, uh, what is the calendar URL? Jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Yeah, that. Go there, and it'll convert to your local time. Yeah, and then on Sunday, Linux Action Show's 10th anniversary. Wow, that came so fast. Well, it technically took 10 years. Yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> wow, that was quick. Good. That was I genius. Just, I can't believe that I've been doing that show for 10 years. Yeah, it is. And what, yeah. yeah and it's not even when you started podcasting, because you started with Cast Blast. Yeah, I know, I know. So, mm-hmm. like, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So we're going to celebrate the 10th, and we decided to have some fun with it, so I think it's going to be a great show. So, And we'd love to have you guys be there live. Hopefully we'll make it worth your time. Yep. So uh, all of that's in your time zone at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. So is there, is there any other PSAs? Was there anything else we wanted to cover before we go, before we wrap up for today? Oh, I guess we should mention the subreddit, techtalktoday.reddit.com. Yes, and then just the main, main other thing was the calendar change for this week with Unfilter. Yes, yes. That's, so always check the calendar for that kind of stuff. We try to keep it pretty even, oh, Stephen, but... I know. What, um, what, what? what? Like, remember the 10-day store that I've mentioned in the last, I think, two shows? Uh, a lot of those campaigns ended yesterday successfully and are printing. So for those of you that did partake in that, those are on the way. Ooh, cool. Did I get any? Uh, I got you some more bags, some last tote bags. Oh, from the, nice. Which that one actually is still I active think, we didn't, right Noah now. Noah wants but, one, too. I, I, oh, was, yeah? I set one aside for him, but he didn't grab it. Oh, so okay, yeah. think I, about it. I did three red ones. So. Nice. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I figured we'd end the show with a P- with a PSA itself. So since we just did a couple of JB PSAs, let's do a PSA for Mother Earth, and let's do it in the form of a cartoon because that'll work, especially if you uh, cast it right. So I'll end you. I, I don't even know. I may have even done this once before, but this show had such an impact on my childhood that it deserves, if it has been on the show, a second hearing. And if it hasn't, it must be played as a make good. So I leave you with this end of show clip. We'll see you next week. Hashtag winning. <laughs> By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet. Captain Planet, he's our hero. Gonna take pollution down to zero. He's our powers magnified. And he's fighting on the planet side. Captain Planet, he's our hero. Gonna take pollution down to zero. Gonna help him put asunder. Bad guys who like to lose. You can be one too, cause saving our planet is the thing to do.